You can have a seat real quick. I um, want to introduce a special guest to you today. We have actually uh, four brothers in Christ that are going to be coming today to talk a lot about uh, this incredible movie that's going to be coming out in mid-October. But uh, we did just um, uh, last minute get to corral in one of the stars of the film that is, uh, that is just one of the greatest stars really at this moment in history in all of Hollywood. I'm going to show you a video that's going to be an intro video. But before we show you that intro video, before we get into you being reminded of all the movies that your parents put in the DVD player on the drive down to the beach, all right? And that you go, man, I saw him in that, and I saw him in that, and I loved him in that. Before we do all of that, uh, I wanted to read you a few things that you don't hear about the incredible Sean Astin who's here with us today. Real quick. <laughs> yeah. All right. Here's a couple things. Here's a couple things that you might have not known. I mean, I know you've seen his movies. You love them. Here we go. Hold on. Sean graduated from UCLA with degrees in English and in history. So he's a college grad, speaking to a bunch of wannabe college grads, all right? Sean served, listen to this, this is impressive. Sean served on President Bush's Council on Service and Civil, I mean Civic Participation, and he was a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army. His, his greatest his greatest accomplishment, though, is that he's been married faithfully to the same bride for 24 years. Amazing man, 24. He has three daughters. His first one just got old enough to go to college, and she chose Harvard, but that leaves us two daughters. We want to talk you into bringing your other two daughters to the Christian Harvard, the greatest university on the planet. Come on. Liberty University welcomes you, Sean Astin. Thank you for being here. Let's watch this video real quick. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Fuller, the ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end. Because how could the end be happy? A new day will come. And when the sun shines, it'll shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you. was awesome. I'm not sure what was better, seeing the footage or watching you guys. Probably watching you guys. I want to say thank you to Liberty University, to everyone for uh, letting me come here, and my colleagues who you're going to hear from in a minute about this beautiful movie that we made. Um, you know, everybody, you always talk about platforms. Is so-and-so going to use that platform well? My acting teacher, Stella Adler, talked about the platform, and when the actor goes on the platform. Well, this is a platform here at Liberty University, and it is a special place, and it's a special time, and it's very meaningful that all of you are here and that I get a few minutes to speak to you. So for the next couple minutes, I'm going to try and be worthy of the opportunity to stand on this platform. I have a confession to make. I want you all to hear my confession. Um, I know it's not a Catholic university, but with the Pope in Cuba and going to New York and just feels like maybe it's the appropriate thing. You know, Lord of the Rings is a Catholic treatise by J.R.R. Tolkien and uh, yeah, Rudy is a Catholic. So I just feel like I, I have a moment. 
judge not lest ye be judged. Did I get that right? Is that right? Is that how the passage goes? Judge not lest ye be judged. My confession is that from childhood I have judged you. I have sat in judgment on Liberty University. I have sat in judgment on evangelism. I've been hmm, caustic at the idea of how Christ's message commingles with culture and life and politics. And it felt to me a lot in my life like maybe the evangelism was preaching within its own space and was not being helpful beyond its own space. That was my judgment. But when I saw that Liberty University in its cleverness, its insight, its intellect and wisdom invited the democratic grassroots uh, surging candidate Bernie Sanders to this place and he accepted the invitation, I, I, I looked pretty closely at what was about to happen because I knew it was a, a, a meeting of folks who had profound differences of opinion about righteousness. And to watch him, who's been speaking at huge auditoriums and stadiums for a few months now, and getting more and more comfortable and heady as he goes, scared, because I thought he looked nervous standing here. But he spoke his mind, and he spoke his truth, and that's why he is respected by so many. And you embraced him with love. And that was a clinic to the world for what it means to represent a peace-loving God. And I stop judging. So I think I was primed to stop judging by playing a chaplain in this movie, Woodlawn, that you're about to hear about. Um, just a, an incredible opportunity. We'll, we'll hold that for just a second. So my father is 85 years old. He, is, he was Gomez in the original Adams Family television show. You remember that? He. Um, he teaches drama at Johns Hopkins University. He's one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. He was my philosophical touchstone, my moral compass, my, uh, yeah, he, he, what can we say about our parents? When I was a kid, I would always want to challenge him, question him, uh, you know, debate him. Always, you know, seeing the limitation in his arguments and looking for the flaws in what he said. And now he's 85, and for the last few years I find myself not doing that, really wanting to listen to him and hear, and remembering things that he said to me when I was a kid, like, put yourself in the other guy's shoe. Man, that's simple but powerful. Put yourself in the other guy's shoe. If you're capable of doing that, you can almost accomplish anything. Um, what else did he say? He said he had such good ones. Um, now, in the cumulative years of his life, I get to this place where I think, wait, let me just pause for a second. I saw you guys cheered for Goonies, right? The thing everybody wants to know is if there's going to be a Goonies sequel. That's what everybody wants to know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, there will be, 100%, but just not. All right. So my dad, with all of his years of wisdom, I... Um, I asked him, I don't know, three, four years ago, you know, if you could sum it up, Dad, you know, what, what, would, you, what would you say? And he was, his father was a scientist, head of the Bureau of Standards in Washington, now the National Institute of Science and Technology. His mother was a teacher, um, secular, secularist. He, he was, I thought he was agnostic, secular, and then later he, uh, he announced that he was an atheist and, and then a Buddhist, and then sometimes an atheist and sometimes a Buddhist. And, um, he, so, but he's one of the most moral men I've ever met. 
He's one of the most um, considerate, thoughtful people I've ever met. And I travel around the world, and people come up to me everywhere I go and talk about what their experience of relating with my dad was. And it's, it's you know, substantial. It's beautiful. But anyhow, I said, Dad, you know, what, if you could sum it up, you know, if we're going to change the world, what do I need to know? He said, monkey see, monkey do. 85-year-old man, 83-year-old man, <laughs> which to me, and my message for you is your minds are being sharpened now. You're, you're developing and growing in ways. This, this period of time, I know this now because I'm a father. My daughter just started college, and uh, it's, it's just incredible how much life and learning and knowledge. I hope you don't stop when you get out of college. I hope you keep that quest for understanding going, even though society doesn't keep forcing it on you. But anyhow, so I, I see things from that, that perspective. My, people will listen to what you say. Words matter. But more important than those words, and this is coming from an English and history major, so, and a guy who loves, you know, being a wordsmith. You know, you know, my 10-year-old really, really loves me when I can help her with her writing. You know, I'm like, all right, I'm a word guy. Words matter. But more important than words are actions. People will learn from you. People will follow you. People will embrace the ideas that are important to you if you lead by an example that is worthy of their support. So I challenge you all. And I, I was thinking about Jesus on earth and wondering if he could see this room, you know, what, what would he think? And I have this sense that he would just get this great big smile of satisfaction. And I think he would also tilt his head and look and know he has to wait to see what happens after you're in this setting with all that you're surrounded with. So God bless you. This music, I couldn't listen to the words or I'd start crying. God bless you now and in the future as you go out into the world. Usually you get the speech at the graduation, but I'm sort of, you know, you always think, man, if you knew then what you knew now, so now you know a little bit more now. Um, <laughs> What can, I t what can I tell you? So this movie that I'm about to show you the um, uh, trailer for, and then we're going to have my colleagues come out, is, you know, people want to know why do actors choose to do certain movies? You know, is it the money? Yes. Um, <laughs> I always find, you know, some people don't want to talk about that, but I, my whole thing, when I wrote a, a book about Lord of the Rings, I'm like, people want to know about money. Money's important. Money's the, the you know, money, people think and feel and behave relative to their relationship to money. So yeah, so actors choose to do roles a lot of times based on money. Others uh, care not about money at all and they just want to find uh, work that will challenge them, will, that will force them to go places emotionally that they've never been before. Um, a lot of actors feel a call to contribute to changing the world by telling stories that have political resonance, cultural res uh, resonance, moral resonance. Um, me, I'm, my mom, Patty Duke, I don't know if you know who my mom is, she won an Oscar for playing Helen Keller in the 60s, and then she won several Emmys, and she's, you know, a beloved, she, she's 60, she'll be 69 in a couple months, and, and she's, um, but she's a beloved figure, a couple hundred movies of the week that she's done, and when I go around the country, people, you know, love my mom. So, uh, where was I? Oh, choosing. Okay, so actors, we, it's a craft that's been around for a long time. I was going to say 10,000 years, but I don't want to get in trouble in the Christian room. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much. Those two got it. Okay. So, um, <laughs> But anyway, the point is, you know, the plumber, the doctor, the lawyer, the actor, there's a place in the world for the actor. 
And it's an important place, because once you're healed, and once you have a roof over your head, and once you've, you know, once, once you're, everything's taken care of, then what? Then it's time to have your stories reflected back to you. That was the best part, I think, of the, that little clip thing. It was, you know, it's like in the great tales, the ones that really matter. And the actor is there to work in service of the playwright, of the author. That's our job. We sit on the bench and we wait for our name to be called, and when we're called, we go in. And one of my favorite prayers is, allow me to be an instrument of your will. Uh, because in a lot of ways, that's, that's what it feels like when things are operating properly. So for me, it's a, hopefully a healthy combination of the, the financial and the creative. But always, wherever I go, I go with a sense of purpose and a sense of mission about what I'm doing. I never do anything halfway. Always 100%, 110%. I want, even if it's a dumb little low butt indie horror film, I want those shots of me with the guy's jaw falling off to be as good as it can possibly be. One of the best reasons to make a movie is to be able to work with your friends and your family, with your friends and your family. And a couple years ago, I did my first Christian movie called Amazing Love. And Hosea, I told the story of Hosea, and I, I got to play a, a, a youth minister. I am playing a lot more ministers now. Good I'm good at it, right. That was my director, so that's good. Thank you. Um, and Kevin Downs, who's over here, he directed it. And it was right when Courageous was coming out, and he starred in Courageous. And, uh, I, I started getting this sense that Christian film was, was here's another word in a Christian setting, evolving. <laughs> it was evolving. Uh, and, uh, but really, that the stories were being told with, with greater sensitivity and the production value was a little bit better. It's like Christian music. Things, 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 times are changing. Technology is changing. Ideas are developing and growing, and, and, and artists are, are emerging. So this Woodlawn movie is the fourth Christian movie that uh, I, I have done. And I did it because Kevin asked me to when I took it on faith because we're friends and I trust him. And he came and he wanted to have me understand everything about it. And I was like, okay, but I'll do it because I want to I spend time with you. I want to do what you're doing. And his relationship with the Irwin brothers, who you're going to meet one of them in a minute, John Irwin, uh, who are brilliant storytellers incredible cinematic visions, the way they render, um, well, you'll see in a minute. But, but basically, I portrayed their father, Chaplin, Hank Irwin. That was weird, that the directors were talking to me, and I would say, well, can we change the line to this? I think he would say this, and they're like, it's our father. <laughs> but we did. It was an amazing collaboration, and... Um, and it was another moment for me to look at what was called the Jesus Freak movement in the 70s, when Billy Graham was selling out the Cotton Bowl or filling up the Cotton Bowl, you know, one of those things I might have been judgmental of before. And I got to learn about it from the inside out in Alabama, in Birmingham, Alabama. It was, it's a civil rights clarion call. It's a true story about Tony Nathan. Caleb plays Tony. You're going to meet him in a minute. Extraordinary story there. Anyhow, we'll show you, the, show you the footage and we'll talk, but it was amazing for me as a Christian who's has to find a way to navigate talking about my Christianity in such a manner that it doesn't interrupt people's experience of a movie, but it bolsters it. Sometimes the work has to speak for itself, and sometimes you have an opportunity to stand up and, ex and, te and testify. So I am a proud Christian. Because of Christ's message of peace, love, and forgiveness. I'm not an expert on scripture, but those three things will save the world, and I revere that. So 
And that was deepened in me playing the chaplain in the middle of this civil rights crisis who brought Christ to a team, to a school, to a community, to a state. And now with this movie and with your help to the nation and to the world. Jesus says to love our enemies. We have to love those that oppose us. If you only love those that love you back, what kind of love is that? There's something special about you. I can see it. You have a gift, and you have to decide what you want to do with it. I can't. I mean, I play for a team that doesn't even want me. Anybody like me? I'd like to have a meeting with the football team. I've seen things all over the country. Well, you and I can see them meeting. There's something about this. It's not my fault, Owen. I'm trying to coach football. He's bigger than football. What would you say if I told you it doesn't have to be this way? What would you be prepared to do? I'm asking you right now to stand up and make a decision to change. Forgive. Be forgiven. That's how much God loves you. What just happened? Look at me. I'm proud of you. Win or lose, you my son. The good book says, without a vision, the people perish. I say, go give it to them. How many black players you got? Not nearly enough. Why you see that changing? Because it's time. You know the difference between you and these people? They're cowards. And you ain't. Nobody out there knows what's happened with this team. But when you win on this day, they will! They call in touchdown Tony Nathan. He's home draw right in Birmingham. This is your moment. This is your time. So you go and take it. You go and take it. This is what happens when God shows up. Yeah. How good is that? Wow. You know, we believe that uh, the children of the Creator ought to be the most creative. And a lot of times uh, we see uh, Christian music or Christian movies or just even uh, just uh, the, the Christian's involvement in the arts take a back step to what we would look at as um, the world's uh, ideas about the movies and the world's acting in certain things and, and the world's music. But it, it's just refreshing to see a movie that um, absolutely does not take a backseat to any of that in excellence and, and, and screenwriting in movie sco uh, and storytelling and even in just the caliber of actors that are a part of this from John Voight to other actors that will not be able to be a part of this. But John, you did an incredible job, brother. We, what a, what a, just a gift you are Thank at you. this moment to the kingdom, you and your brother. Um, tell us a little bit, well, hold on, uh, Kevin's with us, by the way, and John Irwin and uh, Caleb, who's the star of the film, and then the great Sean Astin yeah, yeah. as well them real quick. But John, tell us what the movie's about. The preview gives us a little bit of an idea. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about it. And, and by the way, in terms of roles, I'm the director. Kevin's the, uh, and my brother and I direct together. Kevin's the producer. If you want to know the difference in those jobs, uh, he solves problems I create. And I'm very good at creating problems and ideas. And Kevin, I'm, I'm sorry for all the uh, and then uh, Caleb, God's got his hand on this kid, and to give him a platform, you guys will hear from him, I'm so proud of his performance in, in the movie. Um, before I say, I just, I just want to say this, um, to you, because I, I want to say it here, and I'm, I've waited to say something like this. Uh, I'll tell you about what the movie is in a minute, but when in terms of why we made this movie and what we believe in, you know, we spent, we didn't spend the normal, you know, two million dollars on, on this as a Christian film. We spent 25 and, and we did that for a reason 
between the making and marketing because we feel like it's time to put the gospel on a bigger stage and it's time to really compete <laughs> with other movies. And so that's a bet for us. And that Liberty models that. I mean, this place, you guys are on fire. It's unbelievable, uh, the, the excellence and the scale of what's going on at Liberty University. It's amazing. And, but that's a big bet. And believe me, uh, I, I think about it at night. And we're betting on two things. Uh, we're believing in two things. Number one, uh, we believe, um, you know, Hollywood is not the hope of the world. We believe the local church is the hope of the world. And we're here to serve and empower the local church. Um, but secondly, guys, and I'm so glad to be able to say this here, uh, you saw that magazine that, that Sean's character was holding, it's cover of Time Magazine 1971 read, The Jesus Revolution, because something so unprecedented and undeniable was going on in kids all over the country that it got the cover, Jesus got the cover of Time Magazine. And if you ask me why we're betting this much money, why we're being this aggressive, why we're telling this story, is because we believe in you. We believe God's gonna do something in this time, in this generation, through you, that is gonna be unprecedented. We believe there's another Jesus revolution. I wanna see it. I'm old, I'm in my 30s. It's gonna happen with you. And, and, uh, and, you know, there's more cell phones now than people on the earth as of last year. You have the potential to do more for the cause of Christianity, for the kingdom as a generation than every other generation before you combined. You're the first generation that actually has the potential to take the gospel to the entire world. You can do it, and we believe you're going to do it, and we want to empower you, and we believe there's another Jesus revolution coming, and we believe it can start right here and in other places, and that's why we're making Woodlawn, is to spark that, and we want to see it happen. And we want to see it with you guys. Um, uh, in terms of what the movie is, it's, it's a movie about a high school that was going to close because of violence due to integration. Nothing could fix the problem. And it was Christ, and it was the entire football team giving themselves to Christ and deciding to love each other that saved Woodlawn High School, shook the city of Birmingham, Alabama, my hometown, and led to the largest game that's ever been played there on a high school level, and its first superstar, to, uh, who they called Touchdown, Tony Nathan, played by Caleb Castile. So it's a great, true story, and we believe if it happened once, it can happen again. Yes, amazing. So you guys, the, the Urban Brothers, I mean, you guys are uh, fast becoming uh, just a force in the movie industry. You, you made several movies. You keep upping your game every time we see a movie come out by you guys. It just gets higher and higher. And then uh, you, you were saying earlier today, we're, we're having just a bite of breakfast, and you were saying that Kevin came on board just as, as an as a incredibly competent leader as well to help produce. He's also acting a little bit in the movie. But the, you were saying why at this moment you decided to tell this story. or. Uh, not even at this moment to, to leverage all your influence to, to just battle racism, to, to, to answer what can actually solve the, the problems of racism. But um, why now? Why not do a few more movies, put a couple more million dollars in the bank, get more friends in the industry? Uh, Kevin, why do you think the timing on this is so um, crucial? Yeah. Um, what's up, Liberty? Woo! <laughs> you know, I've been doing this 20 years, and, uh, you know, if you don't dream it, you can't do it. And it's, you know, what, what is happening right now in Christian film is amazing to me. I mean, you had War Room, number one movie in America just a couple, a couple of weeks ago. It, it's incredible. And, uh, you know, it, David White and I, who is the producer of God's Not Dead, him and I have known each other since we were 20 years old. And we dreamed about a day like this where there would be auditoriums packed and where a uh, Christian-based film would be number one in America. But not only that, take it a step further, where a film that proclaims Christ will actually be uh, on people's lips, will be the thing that people talk about all over the world. And, and Woodlawn is a film such as that because it's a film, you know, you always want your art uh, to be released at a time where it's at its height. 
And so John and I were talking last summer, 13 months ago, and uh, Woodlawn's, uh, you know, as they said, Woodlawn's a story that John grew up with. Um, his dad would tell it as a bedtime story where he'd act out all the parts for him and his brother, and so they knew they wanted to make it into a movie, but the question was when. And so when Mom's Night Out came into the theaters, uh, we took a couple of weeks off, and we said, no, well, now what and when? And uh, we were in a parking lot, I think, in South Georgia with Pastor Michael Catt, and um, and, and we're like, Pastor Cat, when should we do this? Now, keep in mind that none of the events that had happened that dealt with, you know, uh, like the events of Charleston and Baltimore and Cleveland and Ferguson, none of that had happened. And so we prayed for half the night in a parking lot. And at the end of it, both of us kind of looked at each other and were like, you know what, I think the time is now. And, and I believe that God was telling us that, you know, and we were putting up the excuses like, wait a minute, we don't have the money yet. You know, we got to go raise, you know, twelve and a half million dollars to shoot it, another twelve and a half million dollars to promote it. Uh, we don't have a script. We don't have the cast. Um, but Jesus said, you have me. You know, uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That's all you need. And so we made a decision that night that we're going to go out and do this crazy thing, and we got we got to shoot it by the end. We got by Christmas. The movie's got to be finished and in the can and into post production. And that was about four months, five months after that. And I believe that God gets the credit and the glory for this film. All of that was before Ferguson, right? All before Ferguson, yeah. In fact, the verdict for Ferguson happened while we were shooting football in Legion Field with the big crowds and whatnot. The verdict happened that night. We had Birmingham police security around the stadium because they weren't sure if riots were going to break out in key cities. And uh, in fact, one of our actors is from Ferguson. And uh, he, he had tears in his eyes. And I remember going up to him saying, you know, Marcus, if you want to go home, I will figure out the schedule. And we will send you home because your family is more important. And he said, I love my family so much, but the reason that I need to be here is because of what's happening in Ferguson. And so uh, I love the fact, you know, when you make a movie, it's all about family because you're together for three months. And, and like what Sean said, we, we love each other as friends. We want, you want to work with your friends because you, you're around each other so much and you have a common vision and a common purpose. And in Woodlawn, I believe we have that together. Yeah. Man, the star of the film um, uh, is, is you, Caleb. You, uh, incredible. I, I know you and your family as, as Alabama legends. Your father played pro ball and played for the great. You, you played. Tired. Come on, y'all. And uh, but uh, I watched you grow up. I, first time I ever saw you, I think you were nine, buddy. You know. And uh, but now to see God just raise you into this platform, as you were saying, to to bring you in here uh, is refreshing because I know that you're not just playing the role of a of a redeemed young man who who uses football to to really. Um, eradicate, you know, racism. You, this is personal for you. You actually, you, I would love for them to hear a little bit about your own personal faith and then how you ended up here because you, you didn't, you weren't the actor that they hired for this, right? You, you auditioned, but tell us a little bit about both your personal faith and then how you ended up playing center stage in this very pivotal movie. Yeah, totally. Um, first of all, thanks for having us, uh, Mr. Nasser. It's been awesome to be here. What's up, Liberty? Y'all good? Yeah. Y'all look good. You look good. But no, um, okay, yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're not going to go there, I promise. Or will we? Or will we? Yeah, Maybe. Anyway, inside joke. So, yeah, just a little bit, more, like, about myself. Uh, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama, and um, I was, uh, yeah, 205, what's up? And, um, my dad played NFL football, college football. Both my brothers uh, did the same thing. I played college football at the University of Alabama. And um, I, I, there, you know, won two national championships and um, great success, but um, I, was so, I was so lost in the world that I didn't have a vision for what God really wanted me to do. And, you know, I was doing run-of-the-mill Christian life. I didn't have the relationship. I was speaking about this last night to some young people. I didn't have that intimate relationship uh, with God. It was more something that was routine. And, um, you know, it, what's so funny is that, guys, the, it, to our generation, like, he, the devil is such a letdown. <laughs> 
He is such a letdown. You know what, you know what he's like? He's like, when, I'm a shoe fanatic, right? So I go in, I always love to find these special socks, right? They make these like booty socks and they're like, they're like perfect size. Booty. Yeah, they're, they're perfect size so, so that you, so that it shows your shoe right, you know, just the ankle, whatever. So every year they, they make these new socks. They, they're supposed to be new and improved and I get sucked in every single time and it's so annoying. I put it on and it just goes, I end up all the way down the toe of my shoe and it's just like, I thought this was going to be awesome. It was fun for a second and it's a total letdown. So the devil's kind of like a saggy sock. <laughs> like, he's a total letdown. And so like for a while, I was living that way. And when I, <laughs> I don't know where that came up, but just all of a sudden. But um, when I came to my senses and I did develop that relationship, God gave me a vision for my life and that vision was that I wanted to impact people and I wanted to do those things that Sean mentioned, those characteristics of, of Jesus, uh, love, peace, forgiveness, and um, I'm going to use that platform to do so uh, through, through my acting career, but it's been an incredible ride so far. So tell us about how you ended up in this role. Yeah. So. <laughs> I leave Alabama after uh, that last national championship and I'm like, you know what, this is, uh, you know, uh, John talks about this all the time, you know, Ben Affleck said in Argo that uh, film is our children's greatest teacher. So I'm like, man, that's a huge, that's huge. That's something that I could, if I can get into that, God, if you can use me in this medium right now in our world that is just shaping our culture, shaking our culture. Um, you know, I, I'll honor you with it. So I go on this acting path. I get an agent in Nashville. Um, I'm flying everywhere, spending all type of my parents' money that they barely even had. Dad's like scratching for change, you know, trying to get me to auditions, uh, which I love my parents, by the way, guys. Honor your father and your mother, guys. I love my parents. Um, but yeah, so I'm on that journey and, uh, and like two and a half years after my first job uh, in a country music video, <laughs> me a big actor, <laughs> and uh, I, I get this script. Uh, yeah, I'm black. Yeah, I get it. I get it. Only, only guy in the video, of course, only black guy in the video. So, uh, <laughs> um, so two, about two years after that, uh, here comes this script. Uh, my agent sends it and he's like, dude, this movie's for you. At, the, at that time, I was in the, in the grind of it. I had turned some things down that compromised you know, what I believed and I was kind of stuck in this rut and I was praying and this script came, fell in love with it. So much so I even just claimed it. You know, I, I, I signed the script and dated the script the night I read it. And I was like, God, this is going to be my film. Four weeks later, of course, John and Kevin had other ideas. They hired another actor. <laughs> and um, God still had a plan. He still had, he was still making a way. And three days before production, after I had been hired as a, a stunt double, um, his brother Andy calls me and he's like, dude, we can't get our actor from London. This is a huge movie, guys. You got to understand, they auditioned over 400 actors for this role to play their Tony. And Andy calls me and tells me he can't get his guy. You know, and at that point, it was Halloween morning. He wakes me up really early and he's like, you know, uh, explains the situation. And there was such a peace on me because God had like prepared me in ways that I didn't even realize. And then when Andy said that, well, he made the call, I was ready. You know, and um, it, we made an incredibly uh, well-made film. It's just, it's, it's so rich, it's so loving, and it's so full of those things that Sean mentioned. It's awesome. Can I just say one thing? This is an important announcement. Um, you know, not only is uh, Caleb an incredibly talented actor and a man of God, uh, he's also single. I don't oh. know. <laughs> if that yeah. Put it right down here. Ring by spring, buddy. Ring by spring. That's what we do. Just say it. Here at Liberty University, we offer Good ring happen. by spring. Good happen. Lord of the ring by spring. Lord of the ring by spring. He is the Lord the, of the ring the by spring. We had the freshman 10. Uh, Liberty's different, I guess. Y'all had the, yeah. 
No, man, we're not Catholic, dude. We're Protestant. You know that, right? All right. Hey, real quick. He is. He is single. You, you I know your there. mother. Your mother would say, you better back up, right, Caleb? Uh, Ms. Uh, hey, real quick. So I have a question for you. And then we, we want to watch a video, John, that you just shot yesterday. But yeah, real yeah. quick, um, you always seem to, Sean, just as a fan of yours, um, I've noticed you always play the underdog, whether it's Sam, you know, in Lord of the Rings, or it's Goonies as the main character, or it's, you know, just you think about Rudy, and you're always just, you, you seem to be attracted to these roles, especially in this role. You were not the head coach of a team. You were the, a, a man of God who just showed up as the underdog and then watched God use you in a great way. When you see the movie, you see what I mean. He was just a, a pastor who came in. Um, what gravity, what, why do you love those kind of roles? I don't know. I think, I think nowadays movies, audiences are so sophisticated that they identify something that's false very quickly and move on to something more interesting. I think it's always been like that, but it's, it just is more and more true all the time. So I think that filmmakers try and find somebody that they think kind of is authentically whatever the essence of that character is supposed to be. And the fact is, I was the shortest guy on the Little League team. Even when my dad was coaching me, I still didn't start. You know, I was like, uh, <laughs> it's true. But I remember my dad at one point, he, he's teaching me how to field a ground ball. He's like, show me, and I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm the Rudy of, you know, West LA Little League. And, and uh, so he backs up and he hits the ball, it bounces off a rock, hits me in the face. <laughs> Nose explodes with blood, and I'm laying down. But I just, I, as I was falling back like that, I could just see the look in his face, like, oh, you know. So, um, so that that's that's my heart. Like, I that's who I am. And they wanted to put when I read the Rudy script, I, I was reading my life, mm. and I thought I have to do this because this is who I. Am. And there was really no question in my mind that I would do it. I was, it was like that. I was just, I, I didn't have that relationship with God at that point. But I, I um. I did feel a sense of purpose, but, um, but I, you know, they, it just, it just was meant to be. And then, and the same thing with, with Sam, you know, Sam is a gardener. That's, that's his thing. His hand is in the soil. Like my, my mom was a president of a labor union and like she, like real people, when I showed up here, there's, there's all this construction going on, yeah. and I saw these guys with hard hats on and like, you know, their yellow things on, I just want to go talk to them. <laughs> it's like they're working hard. There's something about like, if I'm bopping around doing this and talking to a different place and everything, it's like, oh wait, something real. Let me just go touch that for a second and look at that for a second. Um, and maybe if they like movies, they'll be like, oh cool. You know, or somebody's like, I went to SC, get out of here, you know, <laughs> something like that. But, um, but no, that's, that's, with this one, like I said, Kevin tapped me like a, like a coach and just said, you know, come over here, you gotta, you gotta do this. We went, it was two years beforehand, and they did a little sizzle reel, a little um, proof of concept, and I flew in, and they didn't have anything, it was just a couple of cameras and a bus, and you know, and a couple, I think a few football, fl football players or something. But I came in, and they were like, listen, we want you to like, you're, you're the chaplain, and they're explaining their dad to me, and then Hank comes out, and you know, he was a senator, state senator, and he was, he was just very well respected. He had a radio show and a well known, well, you know, kind of a beloved figure. And, and, uh, and so I'm kind of looking around, like, okay, how am I going to absorb his thing, be honest? And I, I remember, didn't, wasn't there a scene in the bus where he says, There's something special about you? Yeah, there's that moment. There's something special about you. I can see it. And you have to decide what to do with it. So those words come into your mouth, and they, they, it's the writer, it's the writer. You're just, a, you're just letting it pass through you and the, the, the impact of it. So anyhow, I think I get cast for the roles I do because I am who I am. Wow, that's amazing. Um, John, I want you to set up this yeah. video that you just, this morning you were saying, hey, yeah. can I just show this? Because before it's the world new. sees it, I want liberty to see it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I do want to say thanks to Sean. Want to, you, he, you know, you got to get an actor to commit, and, and it's such a vulnerable thing to do. And I told Sean with Woodlawn, because of some of the scenes that he delivered that you'll see in the movie, I said, Sean, I need Mount Doom. And what I mean by that is, you know what he says in Lord of the Rings, I can't carry the ring, Mr. Frodo, but I can carry you, which I almost wanted him to... <laughs> Which I, I almost wanted Nerd. to put in the contract that he had to kind of reenact with me and carry him. Anyway, uh, but uh, I, I think actually he uh, should have said potatoes, that, boil them, mash them, stick them in a stew. Yeah. <laughs> but that level, that level of 
commitment, that level of dedication, that level of audacity he, he brought to Woodlawn, and, 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 the, and the movie would not be the same without it, so thank you, Sean. Uh, I mean, it was just amazing performance. Uh, we have this fundamental belief uh, in, in, in what we're doing, that to, and it's a sentence you guys should think about, together we can do more, in the sense that it's time for unity. We're fighting each other, we're attacking each other, and, and we're losing our country kind of in the midst of that, and so it's time to stop, and it's time to unify, and so we've asked the question, what would happen if, if, if some people came together on this film that maybe we've never really worked before together? And we've added uh, someone that I'm a huge fan of and, and have such deep, deep admiration and respect for, and I'm so glad that over the weekend we have forged a partnership and that we will announce later on this week. Uh, it's not announced, but I thought we would announce it here and uh, let you hear their heart for the project. Yeah, so we're gonna, here's what we're going to do, guys. We're going to watch this video uh, that was just literally shot yesterday uh, in Los Angeles and brought to us before they release it out to the world. After that, uh, I, John, I'd love for you to give us some action points. One thing I want to tell our students is the movie comes out October the 16th, but we want to champion it, that we believe in it, not just because it's a Christian movie. It's more than that. There are Christians in the movie. It's an important movie that I think tells well, an incredible story. Yeah. It's unapologetic evangelism, but in such a manner that people, it's not threatening to other people. And I think that's the most effective kind. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's very incredible. You're going to love this movie. Trust me. Your friends will thank you for it. But after the, after the video, uh, John, if you'll give us some action points, yeah, and, then, uh, and then we want to, at the very end, before we dismiss you, we want, you get, we want you to get your phone out and hashtag Woodlawn, all right? As a matter of fact, the, the first 250 of you that we count in that, we have a ticket for you on release date for that, all right? Uh, and then, uh, but hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't be doing that during this little you better moment. Time stamp it. Hold on. Uh, no, we're okay. going to time stamp it. All right, but uh, let's watch this, and then John will give us some instructions, and then we'll give you some really great uh, big news uh, on the end, and we'll dismiss. Let's watch this video. What's great is the momentum that's occurring in the entertainment world around faith is undeniable. And, you know, I'd like to think we had little to do with that, with the Bible series being so prevalent in 100 million households. And we said at that time to you, Dave, you know, we thought it was a door opener. They open the doors for others to make faith films as long as they were made well. Woodlong is such a movie. This is brilliantly made, and we are so glad to be executive producers on this movie. This is a football movie. This is exciting. This is big. But underlying all of that epicness of these giant stadiums and this exciting football game, is a story of love and of Jesus. And uh, this movie really, really touches a chord deep with inside you. It does. And it's empowering too, you know. I was, it's stirring stuff. And we have a scene in Woodlawn where the chaplain says, Who's going to stand up for Jesus? And they all stand up. And it made me, I was watching it in my bedroom, but I wanted to just stand up on the bed and say, I want to be counted, you know? I want to follow you. I follow this message of love and forgiveness, this one message, a message of unity. And, and you see the potential for this, that if it's seen around the country, that it will bring people together. And you know, we love what we do, making films. And you know, we love each other as husband and wife, but when you can make a film, that can touch people's lives, that takes a message of, of the importance of this message, and that it brings, you know, that love, that connectivity, the gospel, really. It's, it's the gospel, but brought through this football movie. I mean, that's incredible. And we just pray, we pray that many, many people will see this and be touched by it. Fantastic. So we would, we would like to welcome Mark Burnett and Roma. Uh, to the project as executive producers, and, and uh, they're such dear friends, and, and we're all championing this thing together because we feel like the movie can help uh, empower you to heal this country uh, because Christ is the answer, and, uh, and it's, it's great to have them on board. So thanks for, thanks for playing that for me. Okay, just one thing. When, um, you know, Lord of the Rings was years in the making, years and years in the making, and uh, two just in the filming of it, and then it took them a long time to finish it and everything. 
It was scheduled for release, I think, December 17th or 19th, uh, 2001. And September 11, 2001 happened. And the entire planet recoiled in horror at the nastiness and villainy that exists in the world. And then, I, I believe providentially, Lord of the Rings was available two months later that allowed the whole planet, it made over a billion dollars, you know, just in the theaters. It allowed the whole planet to, in a safe space, explore those ideas of the nature of good and evil and to, and to go along with characters they love. One of the things that Lord of the Rings had going for it is Tolkien's books were among the most uh, sold books around the world. This kind of movie coming right now at this moment in American history, in American life, when the relationship, the civil rights movement is struggling yet again, like it was, I was nominated for an Academy Award in 1995 or six after the Rodney King riots when I made a, a movie about this, this issue. And it's just, it's title, it just keeps coming back. And every time it comes back, there's another opportunity to do something. So what, when it falls out of, out of the media attention, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means there isn't a flashpoint case-specific thing for them to focus their attention on from the violence through the case. But everyone you know, everywhere you go, has some relationship to this idea. So what I said to you, he's going to do action points now, the boss is going to do it in a second, but what I would say to you is, your words will mean something when you try and articulate what you just saw Roma talking about there. But what will be more impactful, in my opinion, is if you experience the movie and it means something to you, share how it feels to you, to other people. You know, go, go on your Facebook and ask your mom and dad to go see the movie because it it meant something to you. Ask him to go see it on opening night and say you want to talk about it afterwards. It's not just Twitter that is going to, that's going to create something. That's the opportunity. You do not have an obligation to do this. But this is an opportunity that's created for you. And a movie like this, $25 million, $12.5 million of a, of a publicity budget is nothing. It's infinitesimal. Most studios won't touch a movie unless its absolute minimum publicity budget is $25 million. So the, what these guys are doing, what Caleb's been doing, these guys have been doing traveling around all over the country, meeting with churches and pastors and meeting with congregations and really trying to build this grassroots movement. Well, it's very clear to me that you are in the vanguard, that you are the leaders, the ambassadors, the foot soldiers, to use a crusader term. <laughs> uh, who can carry your love for something if you feel it, as we hope you will. That, that's how I think it'll work. John, give us some give some action points. Let's all get out our phones if we, so we can yeah, uh, yeah, really yeah, come uh, along. Yeah, did, and we want to pray for phones. you guys at the end. Absolutely. As well. Just very quickly. First of all, we made this decision while the video was playing. Uh, I love, uh, I love create. Like, oh, by the way, isn't this making decisions uh, in the moment? We've asked this question, like that we haven't decided yet. Where should the star of the movie, Caleb Castile, hang out on the weekend while the movie's opening? And we thought maybe we should send Caleb to Liberty on the weekend that it's open. Would you guys like that? Would you guys like to just hang and party with the star of the movie as the movie's opening around peace the nation? On, peace on me. <laughs> <laughs> it might be fun. Would you peace enjoy on. that? Well, I think I just announced it, so the PR team has to do it now. I think yeah. that's just the way you do it. Yeah. Better to get forgiveness than permission. So Caleb Castile will be right here on the weekend, and you guys can party with him. And here's why that's important. I want to talk to you about this little thing you've got, we've got to use together called FOMO. Anybody know what that means? The fear of missing out. It's dominating all of your decisions statistically. You want to talk uh, about, you know, you want to get under the skin of a frequent moviegoer, talk to them about a movie they haven't seen. They, they'll, they'll drive them crazy. They'll go see it the next morning. We can use this. And here's how it works. If enough of us rally together and make enough cultural noise together, we can get to this group called frequent moviegoers that are buying the majority of movie tickets. They buy 60% of movie tickets, they're only 14% of the population, so that's 40 million people buying 800 million movie tickets. You want to know who they are? They're almost a dead-on statistical match for the generation leaving the church. The new unreached people group in America, an 18 to 35-year-old single. 
And the way we can get to them is the fear of missing out. And we're going to make so much noise together all over the country on October 16th, the weekend of October 16th, that we're going to get a generation back by sheer curiosity. We can do it. We can do it together. It can start here. So we ask you to storm the theaters here, and we're going to send Caleb to you. How about that? Yeah. You'll hear about the details of that. Listen, um, I don't want just a hashtag Woodlawn movie. Like, put a statement, whatever you feel like you want to put about the movie. You know, just, again, I think you have a voice into the life of those who follow you on Instagram and, and on Twitter. And so, again, just uh, champion this great movie. I, I promise you, your friends will thank you for it. It's phenomenal. I saw it a few months ago in Dallas and was just blown away, bro, by the movie. Hey, so thank it. you. And, yeah. and, and if I could ask you guys to do something, this is just selfishly. Uh, this happened, there's a scene in the movie, you'll know where it is. You guys should do this in the theaters, because in screenings, this is happening spontaneously. Because Sean has this incredible testimony of a candle lighting that he was at, at, uh, at in Dallas with 100,000 people. Um, and, and spontaneously in theaters, this is happening. Have you guys ever done this where you turn the LED light on your phone? Turn the LED light. This will show you what we can all be together. Turn your light on. Look at what we can all be together. When we all do the same thing at the same time, look at what happens. Look at what happens. If you don't own a smartphone, I'm sorry. Yet this, Isn't that cool? this reminds you. You're not in the actual dark. Guys, we're more powerful than we think. You're more powerful than we think. Totally. And we can do this. We can do it together. Absolutely. God bless you. Thank you yeah. for having us. Let's Thank pray you for guys. them real quick. Can we do that? And we always love to end with prayer, and I know uh, we always ask, how can we pray for you? But, uh, and I know that we're asking God for favor. We're asking for the Lord to uh, continue to maintain um, uh, opportunities for you to stay humble. Caleb, he here's a, a world-renowned actor, and here you are, like, starting out in your first major movie. Um, and uh, I just pray that you would stay as grounded. Um, and, and as humble, and that you wouldn't get a big head as the world begins to know right. your name more and more. Yeah. So let, let's pray. Let's pray for these brothers. All right. Father, thank you for this movie, Lord, that, that really tackles ignorance. Father, if, if racism is ignorance activated, thank you that great wisdom comes through redemption. And so, Lord, we pray that this movie would be a vessel used by you to do that, but then even greater than that, that it would be a vessel used, God, to present the gospel to millions and mil millions of people around the world. I pray for these men, Lord, even in this very busy season as they go and they champion this movie, Lord, I pray that uh, you would protect their wives and children at home, that, God, you would just put a hedge of protection around their heart. God, just give them um, the ability to spend time with you, that God, late at night, early in the morning in those hotel rooms while traveling, that they would find um, just alone time, God, with you, that your word would, would plant itself deeply into their life, that their prayer lives would be robust. Give them a sustainable pace, God, even in this very, very busy season. We pray this in your name. Amen.